The big news of October 5 is that OPEC has announced it is planning on reducing output by 2 million barrels a day, uh, despite the fact that there's a war raging in a major energy producer uh, and energy prices writ large are really high and global inflation is high. Now, uh, some people are, of course, well, I shouldn't say some people, a lot of people <laughs> are, of course, latching this onto what other, th their favorite drum is to beat at the moment. Some people on Twitter have said that, uh, you know, of course, they're doing this to stick it to, quote, my boy Biden. And, you know, my boy Biden? Ew. No. Far more important, far more important, is that OPEC is nowhere near their production quota. In fact, as recently as August, they were about 2.8 million barrels a day below it. So <clears throat> if they cut their quota by 2 million barrels a day, that actually means they might increase output. So, you know, number one, let's wait to see what happens here. The problem here is that if you are outside of the Persian Gulf, uh, OPEC members, so Kuwait, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, everyone else has just been in this investment bomb for over a decade. Uh, in fact, since 2014, total investment to all oil and all natural gas globally, government, state company, private companies, doesn't matter, the total is down by about two thirds. And the non-Gulf OPEC countries are no exception. Places like Gabon and Nigeria and Venezuela are just borderline incompetent when it comes to maintaining their own energy infrastructure anyway. So they're completely dependent on internal investment, and yet they think they have uh, checks that they need to write so they don't provide the investors with particularly great terms. And so if you're those investors and cash is limited, you try to put your money elsewhere where it's going to be more productive with a more reliable partner. And that manifests as lower production in a lot of OPEC states to the tune of apparently 2.8 million barrels per day. Now, in the last few weeks, about a fresh million has come online, mostly from Libya and Nigeria. Uh, because a certain confluence of events have allowed them to increase input in, or output in the short term. But don't expect that to drop. Both of them are very close to record low outputs at the moment, and they'll probably be back within a few months. This is kind of how it shakes out with these folks. Anyway, bottom line is before you ascribe any sort of motivation to OPEC, you know, the favorite one being that they're trying to stick it to Biden because Biden is green and hasn't been exactly kind to the Saudis. There might be something to that, but we're not there yet. Don't ever, in this line of work, listen to people what, listen to what people say. Watch what they do, especially when you're talking about folks in the Middle East where suicide bombs are often perceived as a legitimate form of political discourse. The rules are different over there. And we need to keep that in mind before we jump to any conclusions. So wait, watch, let's see what the Saudis do over the course of the next few weeks with their actual oil exports. That'll tell us everything we need to know about what it is they're trying to actually achieve. There were a lot of efforts early on in the war, especially by the Europeans, to shut Russian crude oil out of the market. All told, roughly six to seven million barrels a day of Russian crude and product goes west to Europe. They are by far the primary consumer and they are primarily in control of the infrastructure that allows delivery. So it's really hard to send it anywhere else. What you can do, however, is put it on a tanker and ship it around Africa and through Suez and get all the way to India and China. And that is what is happening. In the early weeks of the war, we did see about a million barrels a day of Russian output shut in. It was a very good start. But then these longer haul tankers came into play and the Russians are more or less back where they were in terms of volume of output. They're having to give discounts of 30 barrels, uh, $30 a barrel, but they're still getting their crude out and the Indians in particular are very happy to buy it. Now for the Indians, this is a little obtuse and perhaps not the best long-term play. They're trying to enter into a informal alliance with Japan, Australia, and the United States, three countries that are participating in the sanctions, uh, in order to counter China, and instead the Indians seem to be working towards building a China-centric Asian economic system. So it's not going to fly for the long term. This past week, the week of June 12, the uh, Europeans have put into place a new set of sanctions. These not just targeting oil specifically, but some of the support infrastructure that goes into it. Most notably 
maritime insurance. Now, I'm sure some of you just like insurance, really. We're going to talk about insurance. How boring. But it's a critical issue. Uh, if you can't get insurance, your ship can't go into port. If you can't get insurance, you can't go through Suez. You can't go to the Turkish Straits. If you can't go through Malacca, you can't dock to pick it up or drop stuff off. And if something happens to your vessel, you are out the entire cost of the vessel as well as whatever it happens to be carrying. So it is kind of the, uh, the sinew that links global shipping together. It's critical. And if you can't get it, you can't play. Well, the Europeans and the Americans combined control 95% of the market. And now anyone who wants to ship Russian crude has to use a Russian state company by the name of Russian National Reinsur Reinsurance Company, so RNRC. It's not a company that has a lot of expertise and it's not a very large one. They've massively increased the amount of cash it has to work with, but it only brings it to about $5 billion. According to their own policies, that's only enough to in provide indemnity to five ships at a time, although they're obviously going to stretch that. So we're now going to be in a situation. We're going to have long haul tankers, which are some of the more expensive maritime vessels that are out there, transporting 2 million barrels of crude, which is now in an elevated price environment, past NATO countries to do an end run around NATO sanctions to get to countries that are willing to run the sanctions, primarily India and China. Uh, this is like the perfect setup if your goal is to crush the Russian state budget. Because one super tanker loaded with crude at today's prices, that's about $300 million. And if a NATO country grabs it for whatever reason, the Russian state has to pay that out. So all of a sudden, we're in this really interesting situation where if the West wants to cause a few international incidents, it seems to be in favor at the time, they can absolutely destroy the Russian budget in absolutely no time flat, while at the same time introducing a risk premium to anyone who wants to buy Russian cargo of any type in any market at any time. So this next month is going to be a lot of fun to watch. Now, if Russian crude does go off the market, it's not like there are no consequences because, you know, we're already in a tight market environment. This has the potential to shut in four to five million barrels a day for an extended period of time. That will easily send oil prices above 170. And if it happens because the United States, supposedly the guarantor of all maritime shipping, is starting to interfere with maritime shipping, you're also going to see higher freight rates and insuring rates on everything. So this is potentially a very inflationary move that will then trigger a lot of secondary outcomes from many, many, many other countries. It's time to start thinking more aggressively about the United States, for example, barring the export of crude oil in order to keep its own market under control from an inflation point of view. We're now getting to the environment where that is coming up very fast.